Uh, what I'm going to do, Giovanni, well, first of all, uh, nice meeting you. And what I'm going to do is uh, uh, ask you a couple of questions, like to understand a little bit more about you and background briefly, you know, just to have a, have a better understanding of uh, where you're coming from in terms of knowledge. And I know you are... Uh, uh, is that a good definition to say that you're a scientist? Is that what you are? Like a scientist? Yeah, I'm a scientist. I have a PhD uh, in physics. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I studied astrophysics initially. That was uh, the field of uh, uh, specialization for me. Um, in particular, gravitational waves, what is what are called gravitational waves. Okay. Uh, so it's actually my entire career is about studying waves, you know like periodic phenomena, something that goes up and down, you know, and I have done that in different fields because I started as an astrophysicist, but then at a certain point, uh, I changed uh, the field and they went to uh, neuroscience. neuroscience. And in yeah. particular, I studied the science, uh, the neuroscience of uh, uh, sleeping, uh, you know, the brain, what the brain is doing while we sleep. Uh, and also there, it was all about waves because uh, I was trying to understand how brain waves look like during different phases of sleep, in particular this phase called the slow wave sleep, you know, where uh, the brain oscillates with very, very slow oscillations, you know, like yeah. one per second, and, uh, and also how, how to amplify these waves, how to make them bigger, because if you make them bigger, then sleep becomes deeper, and then you improve your memory and other things like this. Uh, and then, you know, when I started to move my attention to financial markets uh, because I, it's not just Bitcoin. I also studied uh, stocks. I studied the different type of commodities. So I tried to use uh, whatever method I used in science, uh, you know, in studying astrophysical phenomena, studying the brain. I tried to apply the same methods to the market. Yeah. And it works very well because... Uh, you know, I'm not the first physicist that studies market no. uh, or mathematicians. There are a lot of them, you know, like Wall Street. You know, most quants, what we call quants, are people that have math and physics background. You know, in fact, actually, uh, sometimes we complain in, in physics that too many people are going to finance instead of doing, you know, studying the atoms, studying the <laughs> galaxy, you know, whatever. But, you know, there, of course, there is more money there. But, you know, yeah. one of the most, you, you know, uh, the medallion fund, right, that, by Simon, right? So yes, it's like yes, one of the yeah, most yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, successful, successful funds in the world. Right? And I say this because, you know, uh, sometimes people make comments, you know, when I have an interview like this, you know, say, why are you talking to a physicist about finance? You know, what yeah, are... Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, <laughs> we are among the most uh, uh, successful traders in the world, you know, like so, algo trading, is mostly done by people with a physics or math background or both, you know, and uh, and so this is what I tried to do. Uh, and at the same time, you know, to, my my focus was on Bitcoin, and uh, and this is when I discovered a lot of uh, things. But yeah, to answer your question, sorry if I no no I, no, it's good, it's good, I love it. Uh, so yeah, I am a scientist, you know, and I have been a scientist since I was like a little kid <laughs> because. Uh, <laughs> My, my father was calling me professor. You know, I was always interested in science and uh, technology and trying to understand the universe, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah, I am a scientist. That's wonderful. And I know uh, I've watched uh, a couple of your videos. I know you had collaborations mm -hmm. already in the past. And uh, the most uh, amazing things that you talk about is um, I don't want to call it a strategy. It's more like a theory that you came with and you created and you. Yeah. And um, and yeah, I want to hear a little bit more about that. You know, the audience probably wants to understand what does it mean? You know, what does Giovanni, what, what did Giovanni come up with? That's really the yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. So the idea is this, right? Um, I started to look at Bitcoin very early on because uh, um I had these, uh, I saw these articles. Uh, so my involvement with Bitcoin was really early, like 2010. Mm -hmm. And I downloaded the wallet, you know, I tell all the story all the time. And uh, I couldn't understand how to do the mining uh, because at that time the instructions were mostly for hackers or people with, you know, a little bit more of a computer science background. Yeah. And uh, it seemed a little bit complicated. Of course, you know, if I spend like tw even 20 minutes more, 
I would have got it. But uh, I thought I'm going to put it in the background, you know, and then I, of course I got distracted with something else and they didn't do it. You know, that time you could mine with your desktop, you know, so I could have made a lot of Bitcoin <laughs> just for free. Yeah. And, uh, um, but uh, um, later I heard again about Bitcoin, like uh, one or two years later, this was still very early, like 2012. It was, uh, I was uh, subscribed to a newsletter, you know, from a group that is interested in life extension, you know, future, futurism, uh, uh, applying technology, you know, to uh, improve our health, uh, etc. It's, it's a movement called transhumanism yeah. that is interesting to me. Um, and, uh, you know, they had this angle where they said, you know, we, we are uh, in transhumanism, you know, we want uh, to change the world, we want to improve it, we want to do all these very futuristic projects, but many of us, you know, don't have the money to do that because we are scientists, intellectuals, you know, uh, but there is this new thing called Bitcoin uh, that has a chance of, you know, it could be like uh, this guy, this is why being a transhumanist, we are a very visionary, you know, we look at the future yeah. and this guy had the intuition of thinking that Bitcoin was going to be a big thing, you know, this is when Bitcoin was literally like a few dollars, you know, at that time, Bitcoin was, I think I remember, like he was even saying in the article, right now it's uh, $9, $7, whatever he was. Wow. Uh, and so, yeah, incredible, right? To think that this thing that is just a few dollars will be something that will change your life uh, eventually. And his, uh, uh, that, that was his prediction that, you know, one day it will be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it was pretty crazy, you know, to say at that time. Uh, and so I, I had no doubts. I read the article I thought, yes, this guy is, is, is right. No, this no. thing is going to go to hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions. And, uh, um, and he had a like, little graph, right? He had a little graph showing what Bitcoin was doing. It was like ridiculous because, you know, uh, exchanges just open maybe like a couple of years before or, or even less. Uh, you know, the first exchanges were like around end of 2010 or something like that. Yes. But we didn't have a lot of data and he was already making some kind of prediction about you know, a model, a early model of a, a Bitcoin price. And this model was, oh, it looks like exponential, right? So exponential means it's going up, 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 up forever, you know? forever yeah. very fast, you know. Uh, but uh, I look at it, I thought, oh, and it looks interesting, but uh, it doesn't seem exponential to me. So I downloaded the data and this when my adventure in understanding Bitcoin from a mathematical point of view started. So basically I have 12 years of experience, right? So, you know, people are talk all the time say, oh, there is this other guy that did this, there are other guys. I don't know if there are many guys uh, that did models, you know, in, uh, since 12 years. I am for sure one of the first people that started to do these models and much earlier than, for example, Plan B, you know, with this S2F. So he's a newcomer in comparison, you know, with me, for example. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know if I was a, he was aware of my models, but, uh, uh, you know, for sure I, I did this before him. Uh, so anyway, uh, when I started to study Bitcoin, I mean, you know, I look at graph all day long. You know, this is what I do. I look at graph, you know, Same. both financial, but also in other fields of physics. And uh, I'm training, looking for patterns, right? And well, almost immediately, I started to see some regularities in the price of Bitcoin that I, if they look familiar and, uh, and these things are called power laws. So power laws is basically when you see one quantity scaling with another quantity. So what is scale? A scale means changes in the system by factor of 10, right? So imagine you have a, like a little animal, right? So maybe this animal is a, uh, like a, uh, a little baby, then the baby becomes bigger, and then it becomes bigger, and then it becomes bigger, right? Maybe like a, a whale, you know, that is born relatively small, and then it becomes a huge, big animal. Yeah. So <clears throat> we are talking about changes, you know, maybe by a factor of 10 of these animals that becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Or other phenomena in nature where, you know, you have a, maybe a little river that starts like a little thing, you know, like a little brook or something like that, and then it becomes like a huge, big river, you know, like a, the Amazon River. So it goes through a process of changing, you know, maybe geographically or maybe in time, and it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So you don't want to focus 
on changes that are small, right? Because if you want to study this phenomena over his entire history, you want to focus on changes that are maybe a factor of 10, right? So when he went from one to 10 to 100 to 1,000 and so on. So with Bitcoin, we are exactly in the type of situation because you know same, Bitcoin man. went from being a fraction of a dollar, in fact, going from nothing, right? Because in the beginning, when people were working on on Bitcoin, you know, with Satoshi and this little group of uh, crypto people, you know, cryptographers, it was mostly like, okay, you do something, I do something, you know, it's mostly we are donating our time, our energy, you know. This actually is part of a story because Bitcoin works in this way, you know, it, it was an incredible idea and attracted the resources, attracted time, attracted uh, um um, you know, maybe electricity because people were running it uh, on their computers and it didn't really have a value, at least on, uh, you know, something tangible that people could pay for, but people dedicated resources, right? Yeah. With dedicated resources, they made it grow and making it grow, it gave more value and this value attracted other people. And so this process started when it was very, very small, almost no value at all. And then finally, you know, people started to exchange money, right? There was a famous pizza event right pizza, where the guy yeah. yeah he bought like a two pizzas for uh, thousands of bitcoins and uh uh even analyzed these events right going back and say okay are they because uh, once you have a model you can go back and say where these events uh valued properly right was the value of bitcoin correctly um assessed at that time when he bought this pizza and it turns out actually it was a bad deal, even a bad deal. <laughs> so I've got much more 10, pizza, you know. 10, but uh, there were other was, events. Uh, I think it was 10,000. Uh, yeah, there were, were other events where actually, um, you know, there was a, uh, like an auction and uh, other things that uh, were done before uh, the market started to open. They were actually almost perfectly valued by my model. No? You know, my, my the model that eventually I develop. Uh, and so it was it's really interesting. But, you know, it, it basically, like I was saying, you know, Bitcoin went from being almost nothing to uh, just a few cents, then, uh, you know, a dollar, then $10, uh, $100, and so on. So we're talking about big changes, right? And uh, so when I talk about scale, I mean tens, hundreds, thousands, you know, changes of 10, right? And uh, so when you focus on that, when you focus on how Bitcoin change over these huge big scales, then you know you realize and this was my first insight so first not immediately focusing on, on time itself but i look at other parameters because uh, the beauty of bitcoin differently from other financial uh, entities like gold silver you know the stock market we have a lot of information about the system right it's, it's a this idea of using what is called on-chain information because yeah. you know we can using software or maybe, you know, companies that are already specialized in extracting all this information, we can get uh, everything. We can know how many addresses there are, you know, how many wallets are open, how many transactions, you know, all this information about the system that we're not available for other type of financial entities, right? Because uh, some information is open, you know, like, you know, the price maybe because it's publicly traded on the stock market, but other type of information like, you know, uh, is not available, right? So uh, maybe how many people are trading, etc. You know, there are like secret pools, etc. We bought Bitcoin. Nothing is secret. It's all yeah. in the open, right? And that is the beauty of it, because then you can download this information and you can study. So one of my first discovery was the number of addresses that one can use it almost like a proxy for number of people involved in Bitcoin, right? Because yes, I mean, some people will open three address, three wallets, other people will open 10, some people just one, but it's some kind of, it's, it's going to be proportional. This number is going to be proportional to the number of users. So, you know, I wanted to test, uh, is there some kind of a relationship between the users and the price? Which is not, you know, a completely original idea, of course, because other people thought about these, uh, you know, like for example, there is this famous, uh, uh, result from Metcalf. You know, Metcalf was a uh, is this uh, scientist who studied network, right? So Bitcoin is a network, right? Because it's about people connecting with each other, 
uh, there are these machines that are mining Bitcoin, that are also connected to the system. So you can think it as a network, what is called a network. And Metcalf, uh, at that time, he didn't have internet, he didn't, you know, the, his uh, reference was a uh, telephone and in fact, landlines, right? So very old technology in comparison with what we have right now. Yeah. But the, is the question was, okay, we have these technological networks uh, that are also uh, financially valuable because, right, you know, a telephone company having a lot of uh, users as a value, right? And, uh, and, and, it, and it's intuitive to think that more value, more users you have, more value you have in the company, right? But the question is, okay, does it go linearly, right? So if you double the number of uh, uh, users, do you double the value of a, of a, of a telephone company? You have to do telecom company. This telephone company has two times more user. Is it two times more valuable? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was the question, right? So it's a very interesting question. And you can do a very simple calculation. I'm not going through the details, but his result was it's going to go up with the square. So if uh, there are two companies and one company has two times more users, the value of a company is not going to be only two times more. It's going to be four, right? Four because times. Uh, two times, you know, more users to the square, that is four, so four times, right? So doubling the number of people using your uh, uh, your telephone network makes your company four times more valuable. If you triple the number, then it makes it nine times, right? Because three to the square is yeah. nine. Wow. If you uh, if you make it four, it's going to be 16 and so on and so on, right? Yeah. So it's going to be, is it great because that means, you know, increasing by a small number, the number of user increases the value of your network more and more and more, right? So that was a theoretical result. It's also based on the idea that every, it's kind of an idealistic situation where all the users are connected to everybody else, right? So it's kind of a limiting case, like the best case scenario. Uh, so this is what uh, it was uh, his prediction. But, you know, with the telephone company, yeah, you know, maybe the company is traded on the market, so you can kind of compare. Uh, but it's kind of difficult, you know. Uh, it's not as easy, like with, I think I got frozen. You you did get frozen, yeah. I hear you, but you froze. Uh, okay, no. I'm, I'm, You're I'm back now. Okay. So anyway, uh, the idea is, uh, um, you know, with Bitcoin, it's really cool because now we can do an experiment and say, okay, now we know almost everything. Now, the addresses, there is some controversy, are not exactly the number of users, but okay, this is what we have. Let's use this number and see if there is something as, you know, maybe close to what the Metcalf predicted. So I didn't really have in mind Metcalf. I was more interested in like general relationship, but you know, I'm, I'm not a network expert. I learned about network uh, more recently, you know, I started to study network properties more. Uh, but at that time, I was familiar with power laws, you know, because something that as a physicist, uh, we are very familiar. You know, usually what we do, like when when we study a phenomena, we look at uh, many, oh, they look on a graph, right? So I want to study this quantity Y versus this quantity X. I make a graph. Does it look like a straight line? Many phenomena look at like a straight line, at least maybe temporarily. Uh, and so it's easy because a straight line is easy to model, it is easy to plot, you know, and we can learn something from this line, what is called a linear relationship. Many other times we you see an exponential uh, relationship, right? So, so if there is an exponential relationship, then uh, the Y related to the X, right? It looks very fast. It's like a curve, right? Like a kind of almost like a hockey stick. It goes up very fast. But if you plot it, so there are tricks that we use, right? So if you use the log of a Y, and then you keep the linear axis uh, linear, right? The X axis linear. What uh, that hockey stick doesn't look anymore like hockey stick, but it looks like a straight line. Mm -hmm. Because we like a straight line. Straight line is easy to see. They are easy to understand and use uh, easy mathematics to uh, come up with an equation that describes the behavior. So we, you know, we do this in transformation. So if you see a straight line uh, in a, when you have a log, you take the log of the y-axis, then you say, okay, I'm looking at an exponential, then you can write the equation, you can do a, a fitting uh, that gives you how fast uh, 
uh, the uh, exponential is going, right? Because there are slower exponential, faster exponential. So you can do this. And then when, uh, if it doesn't look like a straight line in a, what we call log linear graph, then you do a final transformation, which is, you know, there are other things you can do. But uh, one of the things that we do often, because we know by experience that there are many, many phenomena that behave in this way, where if you take the log of the y-axis and the log of the x-axis, now again, it looks like a straight line. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool because what that means is that the scale, because what the log does, it takes, it extracts the scale. So if you have, so if I, let's use a base 10, right? So if I use that, because we have different bases. So if I take uh, the log 10 of 10, I get one. If I take the log 10 of 100, I get two. If I take the log of a thousand, I get three, right? So basically like, you know, 10 to the one is 10, 10 to the two is 100, 10 to the three is a thousand, right? It's basically, you say, what is the exponent of this number? This is what the log does, it gives me the exponent. And so it's basically a way of focusing on, the, on how the system changes in terms of scales, 10, 100, thousands, and so on, right? And so, and, and then I did the same thing with time. That is very unusual. Many people are not used, in, par in particular in financial systems, people are not used to think about the scale, the changing scale of time. But this is what I did. I thought it was it's going to be very interesting to focus on the change in scale of time. So I took the log of 10 of time. And so when you do that, then you see something really interesting with happening with uh, Bitcoin. And if you want, I can share maybe my screen. Yeah, please share, share. Yeah, and I can I show you like I was telling you, I, I, you know, I, I actually, you know, so if we do a, a step backwards, so this was my first discovery, right? So I, it's actually, this is not my paper. It's from a paper that came up in 18, but uh, this is just to show you that actually there is a lot of interest in understanding Bitcoin mm -hmm. using power laws. But these guys, uh, <laughs> you know, because my error was uh, to post on Reddit instead of writing a paper. Yeah. And so this guy <laughs> thought that uh, they did this first and I did this, you know, four years before they did it. So I posted on Reddit exactly the same type of graph, but four years before these guys. And these guys are actually, one of them is a famous physicist called Sornet. He's like a, very famous because he wrote a book where uh, he claims he has a method to predict uh, crashes in the stock market. Um, so he, have, he wrote a book uh, with uh, it's entitled "Why the, the Stock Market Crashes," something like that. It's a, it's a, he's, he has been consulted by NASA. He, he's, a, he's a French scientist. Uh, I think he's called Didret Sornet. Um, and uh, uh, you know, he, I, I was uh, aware of his work. You know, it's, uh, so I, I actually was kind of uh, I was happy that he kind of re reproduced my work you know I even contacted him and said you know you published this paper I I, I did it four years before you did it but it's a, <laughs> anyway so, uh, so yeah so basically see how he has users right so these are addresses basically he did the same thing he used uh, addresses from the on-chain information mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he, he he kind of claims that this is kind of a major of a number of users, right? So it's kind of, kind of a proxy because we don't know exactly how many users there are. So the best thing we can do is to use maybe wallets or transactions, you know, some some kind of a, a measure of activity of a on the uh, network, right? So many users we are using. And so he's plotting that on the y-axis, on the x-axis, and he's plotting on the y-axis the market cap, right? So basically the value of Bitcoin. And uh, and notice why this is a log, what we call a log log, right? So not just log, uh, many people are used to just log in the y-axis, but not many people are used of the log on the x-axis. Mm -hmm. so a big innovation. With for a physicist, they're relatively trivial, but uh, for a many non-physicists, you know, they get like, very surprised that you can do that with the axis uh, x axis too. In particular, when uh, when you're dealing with time, right? But here is not time; it's just number of users. 
time is indirectly involved because of course this is a process that happens in times so that's why yeah. see we have dates here but uh, it's not directly in the x-axis so what you notice when you do that right you have all these dots and these dots are not perfectly along a straight line but you can put you can draw a straight line now when i say draw it's not that somebody draws it by hand you use a, a mathematical process called regression and that mathematical process basically say a hey, measure the distance of uh, all the points and then calculate a straight line that kind of approximate the behavior of this uh, process but it is evidently is not a straight line but you know there is always noise in the data right so absolutely uh, it's kind of going through uh some noise but you know the general trend is a straight line so when you calculate you do this calculation uh you know based uh, on mathematics you're basically trying to minimize the distance of a straight line from the point so it's what we call the best fitting line so it's not somebody doing this by hand like you know some technical analysts do with uh with price sometimes say oh you know, let's connect these dots and this is what i think the price is doing next right so it's actually a mathematical calculation and uh and so here you see also dotted line i think it's simply because they try to uh fit first of a few uh dates like you know blocks you know say few years and say i want to fit first of a few first few years and i get this straight line then if i fit everything i get the darker line so you know just to compare how much this changes over the years if you add more and more data but you know we get this straight line and notice this is a log plot because see how everything is marked in terms of scale right so 10 to yeah. the 3 before so, you know thousand ten thousand hundred thousand a million users and same thing with the market cap right so 10 million 10 to the 7 is 10 million 10 to the 9 is this billion yeah 10 to, uh, 11 is uh, uh 100, 100 billion. billion right uh and so um this is a log log and the beauty of that is that if there is a straight line even approximate but if there is a straight line in a, a log log graph yeah. you know why that is the case uh, you know it's another question and and there are uh, online people can search you there are very beautiful documentaries about this topic you know um i can give you some links you know you can put in your uh, uh, in, your, uh in, in your uh, presentation uh so people can learn more about these power laws but you see this is a uh, the first example and they did this in 2014 i, po I posted a reddit I again i can give you the reddit and they say hey look you know this is very interesting because metcalf made this uh prediction um and uh uh see remember right i told you the square and we can yeah. get the power of a relationship by measuring the slope so if you do a little bit of algebra it's not very difficult to show but right now just trust me the prediction was two so the slope was going to be two but when i measure it it was 1.5 something like that and then when this paper came about so four years later in 2018 they measure it at 1.7, something like that. So, so what do you mean by 2 or 1.5, Giovanni? Can you explain that? So remember, right, I told you, uh, if we want to find some kind of a relationship between the number of users and the oh, value yeah, the, of a yeah, network, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Because the market cap gives us the value of a Bitcoin network, right? Okay. This is this value, right? And uh, his uh, prediction, remember what I told you before, was you know by doing some theoretical calculation metcalf right and we did uh, this uh, graph the slope should be two but when you actually do it in real life you don't get to that is a theoretical result right you get something that is close to two in my case like i say i it was 1.5 when i measured it in the case of this paper 1.7 so it's a number that is quite close to two, but not quite two. And so, you know, even just by doing this little exercise, it's interesting because in one end, you're saying, hey, McCalf was kind of right, right? We are close to two. But remember, it was a kind of an ideal situation. And his ideal situation was everybody was in connected with everybody else. So 
is is kind of like a best case scenario, right? So in a real life network, you will not have that. You will not have everybody connected with everybody else, right? You will have a, what is a less efficient network. So there will be less connections. And so that number will go down, you know? But uh, also that means basically if a number of uh, users of Bitcoin went up by a factor of two, well, you know, the value will not go by a factor of four, it will go up by, you know, two to the 1.5, you know, I cannot do it in my head, but not quite four, maybe like three point something, right? Yeah, yeah. But also, it, it, you know, it will not be simply two times, right? If, if the number of users double, you will expect, right? If it was a linear relationship, you will expect the, the value goes up by a factor of two. No, it goes up a little bit more than that. It goes mm-hmm. up maybe three point five, whatever, it, you know, two to the one point seven it is, right? So, you know, this was already very interesting, and and it's not just like a little. You know, it goes beyond being just uh, um, a prediction of how the value is going to change with the number of users. It's also telling us that Bitcoin is not just like a normal asset. You know, it doesn't beca- become, you know, it's not just random where the price can go up and down. Maybe, yeah, because uh, uh, the stock market tends to go up in general, you know, during a uh, of, you know, long period of time because the economy is, uh, growing, etc. But still, you cannot really predict bio much. Mm-hmm. In this case, you can predict. You know, it's very, very, yes, there is some randomness, right? Because it's not perfectly on a straight line. But it's regular. Over a long period of time, there are other things that drive the price of Bitcoin in a way that uh, uh, is not just determined by p- full randomness. And, and, you know, this graph on the uh, right shows that right because look at this curve right yeah you know that curve that, uh, to me yes it has local fluctuations yes but overall looks very 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 uh you know very regular it now falls, yeah, yeah the, the the beauty of uh, of these so f- first of all let me go back to uh this graph right so this graph is interesting because this is the graph that usually is presented on cnbc you know all these uh different uh finance shows you know because they show these is it's, i think it's a kind of clickbait for them because say look at this crazy asset that you know it goes up and then it goes down yeah maybe it seems like it's going up in general right or, or maybe we just had a bear market you see oh sure you know everybody got excited it was uh you know sixty thousand dollars but now look you know it crashed it and we are only fifteen thousand you know so they talk they talk bad about Bitcoin because it looks very irregular, right? It doesn't look like there is anything where uh, that you can trust, uh, you know, will you put yeah, your money yeah, on this? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so they kind of make all, that may make a lot of fun, you know, because of uh, Bitcoin, because, you know, they want to, they have their own interest or, you know, they want to create some kind of, you know, uh, anger from the, uh, the viewers, you know, against Bitcoin or whatever, whatever is their intention. Yeah. But then, you know, if you take the log of the price, right, you can start to see that there is much more regularity. And almost never they show this type of graph. You know, there yeah. is a type of graph, but uh, they never almost show this graph because if you look at this graph, you start to say, yeah, sure, there are these periods where it goes up faster and then it comes down. But in general, it looks like there is a trend there. There right? is, yeah. Going. So the stars here are the... Um, you know the alvings the halving, you yeah. see that uh, uh when we have these alvings uh, uh usually we have uh, you know the trends starts to go up and then it comes down etc but yeah it looks much more regular now the beauty of this is when and initially i didn't do it because you know remember i focus on addresses and transactions etc and then one day i thought what if i take just the lock of both the price and also the time right because i, I wanted to see if it was maybe a power law in the behavior of the price and relatively to time, because that is really the things that we are focused on. If we want to make predictions, how things changes in time. Yeah. And uh, uh, when you do that, right, remember you go from this to this, yeah. to this, mm-hmm. right? So look at this. When I look at this as a, a physicist, mathematician, I got, I, I, I almost like, 
I say I almost fell from a chair because <laughs> it was like, whoa, you know, look at this. It's, uh, you know, my power law <laughs> uh, uh, obsession started to go crazy, right? Being a physicist. Uh, yeah, I get, uh, I'm getting, an, again, an, a lousy power law here. Look at this. You know, it looks straight, right? It looks straight. Uh, doesn't look straight to you, right? It doesn't yeah. look curved anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. We does. have these oscillations, right? Yeah, we have oscillation, oscillations yeah. as associated with uh, the Alvings. Uh, this this first uh, bubble uh, was not really associated because we didn't. Our first Alving was here, so what, we don't know exactly what caused this. Maybe it was something about you know maybe something happened uh, during this time. You know maybe. Bitcoin was started to be exchange, uh, traded on an exchange, something, some event that caused like the spike when the price went down. But look what happened with general trend is straightened up. So mm -hmm. we don't see a curve anymore. It looks like something that goes up, 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 up. You know, they, they have this joke about uh, numbers goes up, right? Uh, they do, they do. And they do in a very regular fashion. That is my message. My message. So my message, like you say, I remember your original question was, you know, it became it's more. It's not just like fitting some lines or coming up with some, you know, some kind of prediction. It's also an entire philosophy about what this means, right? Yeah. So first of all, it's fascinating that Bitcoin is regulated by something uh, much more than just the, you know price uh, oscillating, going up and down, and randomness. It's these recognizing the Bitcoin base more like a natural law than a normal asset. And so, you see, uh, first of all, is I got a lot of criticism when people say, oh, you're taking the log of time. That is so unusual, so strange. Well, it's unusual for people that are not physicists because, or people that are familiar with the power laws because we do it all the time. Like, for example, in this example, this is from a scientific paper. These guys were studying how animals grow and in particular in this case is uh the tooth of an animal right yeah. so we have two different animals uh, the two curves here are, are two different type of animals very different from each other oh, look what happened they took away the log again why the log because you see this is size you know we're talking about 5 10 50 so we are taking the log uh, of a of a time so in this case uh, how many years are passed by and they are of a size you know, the radius of a tooth, how big the tooth is. And you can see it's a nice, beautiful straight line, right? Yeah. So there is a, a straight line. Yes, there is some randomness there. But in general, it follows a straight line. And what is nice is that different animals have different slopes. So you actually almost can characterize the type of animal by this slope. It becomes this... almost like a kind of a fingerprint for that particular animal. A different animals have different rates of change uh so it's not something that we are a new and uh, not used to do we actually it's pretty common to do this thing it's just that you know nobody I, I think i have i have been the first person to do this type of graph of plotting the price the log of price versus the log of time you know it's, it's not like you know this super genius thing but you know like a lot of nice interesting discoveries are relatively simple right uh, people say oh you know <laughs> why did we didn't think about that before well you know because you all always need somebody that decided to do first right so the it starts yeah and, and then you know but also realizing what it means uh, what are the consequences of this right so first of all i want to point exactly. out a few things about this graph right uh but before i do that let me show you this other thing right so i told you here you see power laws even in time Damn, uh, yeah. and it's a, like a phenomena that uh, you find in nature but here in these slides you know, I show, and believe me, actually, there are hundreds, um, literally hundreds of these power laws that we find everywhere in nature. Like one of the first uh, historically power law discovered was uh, by Kepler uh, that, uh, Kepler, yeah. uh, you know, it's I made a, a meme uh, today about Putin, you know, like talking about the history of the world uh, to explain why he invaded Ukraine. And they did a similar joke with me saying, you know, look at talking about Kepler and to explain you why the price is going up of Bitcoin, right? So long history, but it's kind of <laughs> interesting because, you know, uh, 
yeah, Kepler was one of the first people using power laws to actually discover something important in nature because he took, so he was uh, he was looking at, he had this intuition there was some kind of regularity in the motion of the planets, and at that time we were, uh, you know, still kind of in this uh, mystical understanding of a universe, you know, so he was using all these uh, funny um, mathematics of uh, ancient, uh, you know, like different platonic solids and music of spheres, you know, all kind of different weird stuff and nothing was working. And then, you know, at that time we were also exploring this idea of logs and trying to understand what this log meant. And so by almost by desperation, he decided to plot uh, the uh, log of a time a planet takes to go around the sun, mm -hmm. uh, the switch from the geocentric model to the heliocentric model where the sun was at the center of the universe. We started to understand that, you know, that how the universe worked. Yeah. So he took a log of a time because they, you know, they had the observation since ancient times of how long a planet it takes to go around the sun. Yeah. Right? The Earth is one year, Jupiter is 12, Mars is, I think it's two, whatever it is. Uh, and so you can plot that, you know, take the log. And then you take the log of the size because they even knew that they could measure how far a planet was uh, from the sun. Uh, and when you do that, it was almost like, almost like, you know, me when I did it with Bitcoin, you saw a straight line there and it's something that you cannot tap it by chance, right? Mm, it cannot tap no. it by chance. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and so he realized, whoa, I finally found that, pa you know, that pattern that I was looking for, that I was right, that, you know, there is, is no, you know, some random stuff over there. It's there is something very profound, some deep law of nature that regulates the motion of the planet. Now he didn't know what that law was. Newton came about, you know, if I remember well, almost hundred years later. So it, it took a long time uh, for uh, somebody else coming, you know, but he took, Newton took uh, the result from this observation and it was not a trivial result. That is why we call it the Kep Kepler's law, right? This, this is called the Kepler's law. Because then, you know, by measuring the slope, you also could come up with this relationship. What is the relationship between these two things? And then Newton came about and took that relationship. And, uh, you know, by he, he wrote 500 pages <laughs> book uh, explaining how using this idea of gravity, you know, the force of gravity, you could derive this law, right? He gave a mechanism, he gave an explanation of why the solar system behaves in this way. And, uh, you know, it was like the beginning of modern science, right? It was an incredible revolution. It's why we have cars right now and computers, etc. because everything started from there by using math and science to understand the universe, right? And this is how it came up, from a power law. This is why a power law is such a big deal. Our modern world started really from this thing, you know, by realizing that the universe is not random. There are very precise laws in the universe. And by studying them, understanding them, we can improve our knowledge, our understanding of the universe, technology, etc. Right. So everybody should be really, really grateful to this power law. This, you know, we can joke about them at the same time. They are so important. And so when I discover the power law, because look at this, it's also a straight line, a straight yeah. line in a log log plot. Yes, there are oscillations because, you know, differently from the planet, where it's almost perfect, you know, we are still talking about something that is relatively random locally, right? So locally, I cannot predict what Bitcoin is going to do tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. Yeah, but over yeah, the yeah. long time, yes, the progression is like a power law, right? And it's not due by chance, it's not it's clear there is some kind of scaling property this is another way of describing this that the fact that the change in price when you focus on scale so again scale means 10 100 10000 is proportional to the scale in time so if uh, you know there is a scale a change in time of 10 and it, and it took let's say 10 days to do that change you know, going from zero point one dollars to one dollar. Now to go from one dollar to ten dollars, it will take hundred days, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. Uh, 
because I'm scaling up by a factor of 10 to in time. So if it took, uh, well, you know, 100 days to go from one dollars $1 to $10, now it will take a thousand days. They are, you know, basically three years to go and do that with time. So that is the idea that uh, is proportionally scaling because basically the straight line means there is a very nice linear relationship, not between the price directly, but between the scale. So this, the, the change in scale of the price is proportional to the change in scale in time. You, you understand what I'm trying yeah, to say? Absolutely. I actually yeah. have a question for you, Giovanni. Now, does this, uh, what is the um, a correlation between the halving and what you're currently describing right now? Is there any? Yeah, so the way to think about this, and I'm not 100% sure yet, right? Because it's possible. So there are two possibilities. So it's easiest possibility is this, uh, that there is a general trend that is due to the power law. And the general trend is very nice because if you go back to this chart, mm -hmm. notice other regularities about this pattern, right? Uh, the pattern is that, yes, there is a general trend and basically that is the orange line here, right? So it's the line that goes through the middle. Yes. Then the price seems to oscillate, right? So it seems to go up and down across uh, this uh, orange line. Right. If you take deviations, because this what these bands, these color bands means are deviations, right? So 10 per 20 percent, 40 percent above the trend, 20 percent, 40 percent below the trend. This deviation seems to catch some of the general movement of the coin. So, for example, notice how the green band yeah. is about you know 40 percent uh, below the trend is almost perfectly catching all the range of motion during the bear markets right mm -hmm. so when we are not uh, in these bubbles the price and you know people say oh this is a bear market but no it's not really bear because the price is still going up <laughs> and it's going up in a very very regular fashion yes. so notice how uh, it kind of stays within that green band right so it's a very nice model because it can actually replicate what the price of bitcoin is doing uh, you know, there are oscillations, but still contain within that band. So it's very, very interesting that is doing this because this is uh, allow you to tell when the coin is as a rich a bottom yeah. and then how you will progress during this bear market. Then once uh, every four years, there are these halving events, right? Where uh, basically what happens, and you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows among your uh, uh, viewers, but, you know, just to remind is basically when uh, by code, because Satoshi Nakamoto, you know, the inventor of uh, Bitcoin, programmed it in this way, where uh, he wanted to do a system that is anti-inflationary, right? Uh, that is basically the opposite of being inflationary, where uh, your asset goes, you know, it, it loses value with time. This should go up in time. And the way he enforced uh, this was by basically reducing how many... So the opposite of what the government is doing, that is printing and <laughs> more and more money, yeah. uh, we are printing less and less Bitcoin because every time there is an halving, we are reducing the number of Bitcoin that are producing produced by a factor of two. Yeah. Right? It's programmatic. It's programmed to be anti-inflationary. And so what happened? Because there is less influx by mining uh, of Bitcoin, you know, something... The system responds not immediately takes you know sometimes few weeks or maybe even months but then eventually because you know the miners now they need to sell these uh, coins at a higher price because otherwise they cannot pay their bills their electricity etc so they are forced to sell it at higher price so they, they, everybody else follows that you know so the price gets like kind of there is a shock you know there is a shock mm -hmm. in the system this is another way once you start to think about these not just like a normal asset, but like almost like a physical system, yeah. then you can actually use all this language that we use in physics. We will say there is a perturbation in the system, you know, like, a, uh, you know, there are many systems in physics, like, you know, you have like a spring, for example, right? You perturb it by kicking it or doing something to the spring. The spring starts to oscillate, right? As a response of this uh, uh, perturbation that you did to the system. Uh, and so a similar way, 
the system responds, it has like some kind of a shock, you know, the price goes up like crazy, and then it reaches a point where uh, it's not sustainable, right? Again, something very understandable from a physics point of view, because we study these kind of things in physics. We study like, okay, the system goes to here, and then, you know, it's a critical uh, point for the system, so the system needs to respond, now the system goes down. And so, you know, they, we start to go in, into a bear market, the price goes down, it goes down until basically it reaches equilibrium, right? So this is another way of talking and thinking about these, almost like a physical system, we will use this word, say the system went back to equilibrium. Also, if you want to think it uh, almost like a physiological system, because a lot of uh, physiological systems behave like power laws, uh, it's almost like a homeostasis, right? So where uh, your heart rate goes up because you're running, but then you know you settle down, and the, your heart rate goes back to its original, you know, normal type of uh, uh, beating, yeah. right? Beating, uh, and uh, um, so that is exactly what happens with this, right? So it's not just something again; it's not a story that they're making up. But this is what the data seems to show that exactly. The system responds in this way. So to answer your question, one way of thinking about this is that there are basically two components uh, to this behavior of Bitcoin. One is this general trend that follow this very precise power law in time. And then there are these perturbations in the system that happen every four years. And the system responds in a very, very similar way, right? Because we had the three of these events and it's always the same. It's a uh, going up, it reaches some kind of critical point. Now, it seems to be also a pattern there where uh, the response is smaller, right? You see how yeah. uh, the system goes up uh, much more here and a little bit less here, you know, relatively to these bands, then almost like a, it touches this uh, upper band there. And so there is some kind of a decay. And so you can actually take all these components and put them together, you say, like, there is a general trend, there are these oscillations every four years, there is a decay on these peaks, and then you can put all these together and make a, a composite model, like I mm -hmm. did here, where uh, I have, uh, so basically here, I'm saying, uh, okay, I, I code it in such a way that uh, I say, there are three things going on. Uh, that, uh, yeah, um, there is a, like a general trend that is the, the power law, I can write a precise formula. The beauty of writing a precise formula that is also very simple, I can show you in a moment, yeah. is that you can plug in anytime you want. So you allows you to make a prediction, right? You can plug in a future time and say, okay, what is going to be the trend price for this, uh, if uh, you know this process continues to behave like it did in the past. And then I added these pulses, you know, these, uh, excitations in the system, these uh, perturbations. And, you know, it's a little trick here because differently from what I did before where I say, okay, there is a general trend and it's a, you know, it's a power law. Here, I'm just assuming that the, the system will continue to do this every time there is an alpha. You know, we don't know, but it's, you know, given the tap in three times, we can assume it is continuous to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So every time you do a model, there are assumptions, right? You have to make some assumption, nothing is guaranteed, of just based what you observe in the past. So I kind of synchronize this first bubble to, uh, you know, to my, my model to the first bubbles and all the other bubbles come simply because they are very regular, you know, they happen every four years. So all what they did is say, okay, make them regular, you know, so they tell me where they are supposed to be. And you can see they kind of match very well the previous yeah. data. The blue line is the real data, right? So the blue line is the real data. And you can see, I mean, as model goes, <laughs> it's almost crazy how incredibly you can Precise. really replicate yeah. the, the, the behavior of Bitcoin, you know, within limit, of course, right? Then the other thing I, I imposed in the model say, it looks like, you know, these bottoms, happen all the time a very precise deviations from the trend so i say okay draw me the bottom there of course in the model it will be perfect right perfectly like within this green line because this is what i force the model to be so for example you know in the last cycles we kind of touch it there and we stay a little bit but you know there were some other deviations you know who knows why you know but this is what happened but 
look at this uh, what is happening in this cycle seems actually to go back now we are deviating right again we are going above this green line but in general like we have been within that green band very very closely you know so it's very interesting so this is how i made this part this component and then i added one more component that is the, this decay of the peaks you know because actually you can measure the decay it looks like actually it's very ve well fitted by an exponential so it looks yeah. like a decay by an exponential uh precise but you know that is really probably the weakest part of the model because it happened only three times and uh we don't know if it will continue to decay in that precise manner uh it's just you know this is all what i have you know to go with so i assumed you can think it almost like a worst case scenario right so if uh, these uh, peaks are continuing to go down like this then this is what we are going to expect this is you know the coming cycle you know yeah. and uh, everybody always asks me so what is your prediction for the top so <laughs> if everything uh, is uh, as it supposed, supposed to go to according to this model we are predicting about 200,000 so we are going to be close to maybe 210 something close like that and by the way these dots are not like a perfect straight line because I try to replicate you know the randomness so I put some random noise you know so it looks like a little wiggly because uh I added also some noise uh, to the data. And then, you know, like uh, I can predict the next one, the next one, etc. So by the time uh, we're talking about uh, like end of 2000, like middle of 2033, we are going to have another peak there, you know, the, the next uh, uh, alving, you know, two alvings from now, three alvings from now, sorry. And the price will reach uh, by that time a million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, so and it's if this model turns out to be true and look it's very conservative in particular relatively to other models like uh, stock to flow right that had a lot of uh, um, it was very famous uh, you know the last cycle uh, everybody was talking about it etc that model is uh, very optimistic because basically if uh, if you go down to what uh, the prediction is for that model is that every Alving, we are going up by a factor of 10. Mm -hmm. And that is not what this model shows. Because uh, if you have something that uh, uh, increases on a regular fashion like that with a fixed uh, time, like in this case, four years, every four years you go up by a factor of 10, over the long time, that model will look like uh, going up instead of curving down, right? So it's going to be like an exponential. And so it's going to, in a chart like this is going it's going to look like it's going up and so uh that is to me is not what the data shows it's not an exponential behavior uh, we are not going up a, a factor of 10 every four years we're going up and we're going up fast yeah uh, but not as fast as uh stock to flow predicts so it's actually a conservative mode in a sense and <clears> i <throat> think it's realistic because at least so far you know, the model has been very, very precise in describing what Bitcoin has done so far. It is almost, you know, even if it changes, I still, as a scientist, I want to be, I want to understand why it was so regular. You know, it's so incredible that an asset like Bitcoin behave in a very, very Can regular like that. Yeah. And this is something that no media, I never saw one single media talking about Don't something about like that. that. Of course. Yeah, look, you know, it's no crazy random it seems to behave in a very precise fashion and it's so fascinating you know what is going on you know like uh, almost no media that is covering bitcoin ever described this but i think it's so remarkable you know and i would like to have a discussion with other scientists i mean i know at least uh, uh his, i think his name is fred kruger uh he's like an analyst and he has a i heard PhD. of him yeah he has a phd from St stanford and he's and now publishing a book about Bitcoin. Uh, and I was so excited because, you know, it's one of the first scientists that I respect, you know, and is uh, like an expert in the field. And uh, he actually made a post and said, oh, this model is fantastic. He just discovered it. You know? <laughs> and uh, said, this model is fantastic. And he really probably, so when he plotted in a log log chart, he's a mathematician. He completely understood what it means and what are the significance. You know, you look at this, 
straight graph and you see this this way of plotting the coin is so amazing because it really shows it's a on a unstoppable power law path you know yes. and he recognized it as such and then it was gratifying by the way this <laughs> i made like a meme here uh you know where uh I play around, you know, I say, look, you know, the media usually shows this stupid graph, That's you know, true. Like and uh, they say, you know, it looks stupid and uh, nothing to be trusted. And then, you know, people like a sailor probably are very familiar with these and say, no, no, you know, it's very regular. But I think this is not yet understood by many that actually is something much more than, you know, simply like a nice little curve that goes up, it's a power law. And there are so many consequences, you know, behind the meme, the joke, you know, there is something very fascinating about uh, uh, Bitcoin behavior that is very regular and it's fascinating. And that, you know, because the consequence is also from an investment point of view, because of course, you know, it's not a guarantee. It's not like with the planets where uh, we are pretty certain that you know a thousand years from now the planets will continue to behave we'll be the same, like yeah. David right now with an asset you never know right but for sure uh, it's given that uh, see the philosophy of the power law is also this is that so it becomes much more than just some fitting so one of the philosophies uh so there are so many things is so you can if, I'm going to write an entire book about this topic. Like, first of all, you know, you're familiar with uh, the uh, this book that everybody knows about uh, Bitcoin, uh, right? That is called the Bitcoin Standard. Uh, yeah, uh, of course. And uh, uh, one of the concepts that they discuss there is this thing of preference time, right? There is this example of the children uh, that uh, are offered a cookie, and then the uh, psychologist, uh, you know, the experimenter says, well, you know, if you wait, I'm going to go out you of the room. If you wait, <laughs> you will get two cookies, right? Yeah, yeah. And different children respond in different ways. Where uh, some children are very impulsive, they cannot resist. It's very cute when you see the video, yeah. right? They go and grab a cookie and they eat it. <laughs> but beyond the and other children, they stay there. You know, it's <laughs> really suffering, <Yeah>. and, <laughs> but they stick with it. You know, and. Uh, and then they get two cookies, you know, they're all happy, etc. when the adult comes back. But it's very serious because they did some follow-up studies where they, you know, follow up these children and the ones that actually resisted the impulse to go and eat the cookie and got two cookies, they got much more than two cookies. You know, they were much more successful in life. Uh, they finished their studies, they had higher degrees, they had better jobs, they were much more successful in everything they did in life, uh, you know, statistically, of course, right? Um, but it's, he mentioned this because, you know, he basically is trying to talk about Bitcoin, about Bitcoin now, you know, you need to be patient, you know, if you bought Bitcoin when it was a few dollars and you waited and you didn't sell it because many people did that right yeah. they sold the coin where we were hundred dollars we thought whoa you know i bought it a nine i got a 10 pair of fantastic well you know if they waited and it was a ten thousand <laughs> a hundred thousand a million <laughs> you know right now the rewards will be incredibly more right Absolutely. so the same thing is the same message here we say <laughs> hey you know yes it's not going exponential you know it's not going crazy let's not make it let, let's not hype it up but, and most of the gains you know these very very fast gains we are uh, in the beginning of uh, bitcoin history so we are beyond that but still we are talking about you know at least a 20 pair right in 10 years that is an earned off right which are which are investments that you know you buy for something forty five thousand and it's going to be a million dollar in 10 years from now it's amazing uh, so you know it's it's very relevant that uh concept of uh, preference time for bitcoin and this graph it's an you know embodiment of that principle because it's telling you you know that uh, we are operating on log time so you know it takes longer and longer to go up by a factor of 10 yeah but you know if you stick with it the rewards will be immense and you know and this is exactly what the log graph does 
uh, it's confusing for some people. And this, you know, this is why you see this bunch up here of the dates when you plot it like a log, because what this means uh, is simply that it takes longer and longer time for the for factors of 10 to happen in Bitcoin in terms of price. So this is why it takes factor of 10 in time to actually do the change in price. And so this is a basically like a mathematical formulation of uh, it's beautiful because you know I'm sure uh, the author and you know I would like to have a conversation with him about this, but you know the author of uh, the Bitcoin standard probably was not aware of these, but somehow he had this you know intuition from just seeing the general Bitcoin behavior. Yeah. But now it's beautiful to see it expressed in a very precise mathematical formula. This is the embodiment. You know, that, that is like, a, you know, one of the many memes about Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is time. Well, Bitcoin is log time <laughs> in my philosophy, right? So in my philosophy of a power law, I joke and say, yeah, Bitcoin is log time. So log time means slower and slower, but, you know, it's becoming a mountain, you know, so wait until it's yeah. a mountain, you know. Yeah. So that, that is entire philosophy, you know, part of a philosophy of understanding Bitcoin when as this process, you know, it is a, more like a natural law. It's taking its time, it's scaling up, you know, so there is an entire vocabulary, an entire terminology, an entire philosophy behind this model. So it's, I think it's a big deal, you know, even if a, the a big deal. A, a deal the idea behind, uh, you know, idea and write is, uh, you know, complicated differential equation or anything like that. But recognizing these, understanding it, seeing the consequences, it's a big deal. You know, this is why I'm very proud of this model, and what it means, you know. Even even philosophically, I would say it's a big deal, not just like uh, scientifically, but that is a completely exactly. different, uh, you exactly. know, matter. Because exactly. it's the first time in history where, uh, the retail investors have have a chance to to buy one of the best assets, in my opinion, the best asset in the world before the institutions. And actually, talking about that, Giovanni, do you feel that yeah. this this chart is going to be affected? Because right until 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 what a couple of weeks ago, well, a couple of months ago, yeah, uh, where we had that uh, approval, the ETF approval. There was eight countries, where my audience people know, that there, there was eight countries around the world where we still had, we already had ETFs before America uh, came on board, Canada to be one of them, and I think Brazil and uh, six more. But nevertheless, we all know America to be one of the strongest economy in the world. Um, therefore, the amount of money that are going to come in flow from these ETFs are going to be greater than Canada or Brazil, as we can all imagine. Do you feel that because of those ETFs and ETFs just across the world that I think they're coming up, that we're talking about Hong Kong uh, coming up with their own ETF, do you feel that that is going to impact uh, the price in a way where we might still be within this trend, but we might have some spikes because of that? Because until right now, like this was mainly retail investor money that we're creating this trend. Do you feel that these ETFs and the the, the big dog money uh, will in fact will affect these trends in a in a greater way, or it not really? It should just follow. Okay, so going back to the, it's a very good question, right? And this question with this ask uh, many times because you know of course this is a very important yeah event that you know the ETFs etc. Uh, but see, like I told you before, once you start to see these pattern and ad adhere to this philosophy and you know being the um the person that came up with this philosophy i want to stick with it uh, yeah. and look i am also a scientist so what, there are two things so the first thing i'm saying one bitcoin has done this for 15 years so independently of uh, the predictive power and understanding what is going to happen next, which is you know the most useful thing about this model. From a scientific point of view, we need to explain what happened, right? Maybe it's not useful for making prediction, but it's useful in understanding Bitcoin as a phenomenon. So if you are interested from a scientific point of view, from a philosophical point of view, it's something that needs to be explained. Now, will he continue to do this, right? Well, uh, first of all, if he doesn't, right? So let, let's see what happens if he doesn't. If he doesn't, this model is also useful for that because given we know that has done this 
uh, very predictably, very regularly. If uh, something happens, this model will tell us that, that something happened because we can compare before and after. So that is another useful thing about this model. In physics, that happens quite often where you have a system like this that behaves uh, in a very precise fashion and then changes. And uh, the change, we have a name for it, it's called a phase transition. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, sometimes systems became too large and uh, now they cannot continue to do what they have done before. And so they go from one type of behavior that have done up to that point to another. Or, you know, like another example is when a system goes through a dramatic change, you know, for example, you increase the temperature of water, uh, it stays water, it stays water, then at a certain point, the temperature is so high that it starts to evaporate, right? And, uh, uh, and it starts to boil and evaporate, and then the, the, the water goes into another type of uh, system, right, that is vapor. Yeah. Or, you know, you, you cool down the temperature of the water, nothing happens, nothing happens, it stays water, then all of a sudden goes into highs, right? So these sudden transformation and changes, we call them in physics phase transition. And the system behaves in a very different way because the behavior of water, you know, everybody's familiar with that, is very different from the behavior of uh, ice. And so the equations will change the behavior. So in a chart like this, it will look like maybe it continues to be like a power law, but maybe the slope changes, right? Mm. And we will be able to determine that because if we measure the slope as we get more and more data, then we will see a sudden change. Maybe the influx of the ETFs will make that slope steeper. You know, mm -hmm. who knows? But my answer to your question, so this is a possibility, this is why I mentioned that before. Yeah. But if you stick to the philosophy of a power law, my answer will be like this. I think Bitcoin is continuing to do exactly the same thing. It will continue to do the same thing. And simply... All these events that circum, you know, that are around Bitcoin, some positive events, some negative events, are simply part of a story. Mm -hmm. Right. So when Bitcoin was a small little baby, part of the story was Satoshi trying to involve other crypto people, crypto uh, uh, graphic people in his in this project. Right. He was trying to talk to them. He was showing the code. People. Some people were skeptical, other people joined in. It was part of a process, right? To, it's like a feedback loop you know, of this. I already described this. You know, people were starting to invest their time, their energy. They were debugging the code. They were talking to other people. Other people started to join in. They created Bitcoin talk. And then uh, other people started to come in. And uh, some people started to buy pizza with it, etc. So it's not that Bitcoin didn't go through transformations and events like this. We had many, right? We started to have our first exchanges. We started to have the news talking about Bitcoin. We started to have a, the main uh, stream media talking about Bitcoin. And yeah. then China buying of Bitcoin. And then uh, big company investing in Bitcoin. And uh, uh, some merchant using Bitcoin for their transaction. So it's, it's not that we didn't have events like these before. It's just that. At every process, at every step of this evolution of Bitcoin, there were uh, proportional events, right? Things that right now to us seem trivial and nothing in comparison with the ETF, they were big deal for Bitcoin when it was at that scale. So they were, uh, you know, it's almost like a, in a video game where you're fighting little, uh, you know, monsters when yeah. you are at level five and then you go to a level 100 and now there is a big uh, monster that you're <laughs> fighting. But really, it's set up in a way that is proportional to, because otherwise it will not be fun, right? It will The, the challenge that you're facing is proportional to the thing that you have to, to, to your level, you know? So as you grow in terms of level, you also grow in terms of uh, your uh, challenges. And so I think it is what happens... Uh, because it's a feedback loop, right? Say, so, but how this is possible? You know, in the video game, there is a, a programmer that, you know, does it in such a way that uh, the challenge is proportional to the level of, of a player because it's programmed in that way. How is it, this is programmed? It's programmed in the sense that, you know, ETF will not come in 
if Bitcoin was not ready for it, in a yeah, sense, right? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. came in because Bitcoin is at this stage of its evolution where it's becoming big and, uh, you know, and uh, many retailers and, and companies invested in Bitcoin and there is an infrastructure, there is a network, etc. So it's the right time for the ETF to come in. And so what they, that will do will simply push Bitcoin to the next level, but exactly like it did before, because it's not that uh, it's this crazy event that is a phase transition. You know, it's not something that happens all of a sudden. It's the right thing for Bitcoin where it is right now. Then once it goes to the next level, you know, let's say we start to have uh, the same market cap of gold, there will be other events like, you know, nations, maybe like, even like United States, maybe maybe uh, taking Bitcoin as the monetary standard, you know, and that at that time it will look like this amazing, credible event, and it will be, but it will be what Bitcoin deserves. Well, supposed you know, like to. Like say, everybody yeah. get, deserves get a Bitcoin uh, price uh, as they deserve, right? So the same thing with Bitcoin itself. It gets the event, it gets the world uh, uh, happening that is proportional to what Bitcoin can deal and also attracts, you know, because uh, being that big and important, then there are resources coming in. Do you, know, do you understand what I'm trying yeah, to say? Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree and, 100% uh, your money. And uh, if you think it in this way, then it gives you like a philosophy, right, of uh, what is happening in the future, because he will continue to do this thing. And yeah. it's what it's, uh, it is why, you know, because it's not even if it looks like nice in this graph, right? Where oh, okay, sure, we will continue to do this thing and it going up. It basically what it did before is still not trivial. You know, we are talking about Bitcoin going, uh, you know, having a market cap that is more than gold. And at a certain point, you know, I don't know exactly, but you know, actually, this model will, will it can allow you to tell when that is going to happen. When uh, you can answer questions like yeah. uh, when Bitcoin. Uh, will have a same value of gold, for example. And when uh, Bitcoin will have uh, the same value of all the cash on earth, etc. right? So you can answer this question by the model. That's and it's simply the right thing that it needs to happen for Bitcoin to go up another factor of 10. And, uh, uh, you know, now beyond these, this is why I stop modeling, uh, you know, I took 1 million as my point of reference because Beyond this, it's possible, you know, because there is a ceiling of what uh, the value of Bitcoin can be. You know, I mean, it cannot be more than, you know, all the everything valuable on Earth, right? Now, remember, this is also relative uh, to the dollar. So, if the dollar, you know, it, it's a relatively sustained inflation, right? Two or three percent, whatever it is, per year. Uh, so, you know, the growth of Bitcoin is much faster than inflation. So, it's a kind of almost a, a correction, uh, like a small error, but, you know, it's still expressed in terms of a uh, inflationary dollar. So in theory, <laughs> we could go up forever, you know, if the dollar goes down, you know, there is no really a limit, you know, because, you know, as the dollar loses value, this thing can go up forever. Yeah. But this is why, you know, I mean, predicting 10 years in advance for uh, an asset, it's already like, you know, something that probably nobody ever has done in their life, you know. And uh, I did that five years ago when I was trying to predict the price of Bitcoin now, and I was right. So, you know, I don't want to go beyond 10 years because that's nice. Yeah. we can do it and it will be interesting and one can say something about that. But, you know, let's stick to this and then we can update as we collect more data. 10 but years it's already, is pretty good like, already. Uh, yeah, it's an already <laughs> incredible prediction, you know. And it's, uh, but, you know, <laughs> so again... To summarize, I think Bitcoin will continue to do this. And all the other things that are going to happen to Bitcoin, including right now ETF, is simply part of a plan. You yeah, know, it's simply yeah. what needs for Bitcoin to happen to make it go higher and higher. And it's all happening as it should happen. You know, so it's, they are not going to change radically. It's some For some people, it's disappointing because we are hoping that, you know, now we are starting to go up exponentially. We are going to make a, a tons of money within a few years, etc. But, you know, these are, I think these people are the children that ate the cookie immediately, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and I'd rather be, because I know, I, I, I don't think I did that experiment with me, but uh, 
I was like that. And, you know, this is how you were able to get a PhD because, you know, you have to kind of postpone. In fact, I do it almost to a fault where I, I find myself any time say, okay, I'm going to save this. I, I remember I was saving my chocolate and my Christmas. And, you know, uh, in Italy, we get a lot of chocolate for Easter yes. and I will, I will get it. I will put it in a draw, like a secret drawing drawer in, 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 uh, in my bedroom and then my brothers will come and steal my chocolate because my brother were like more like <laughs> the children that uh, like to eat the cookie immediately and somebody else cookies you know? yeah uh, but you know i was like that uh, for all my life and uh, uh and i think this this is the philosophy that i like and i want to adhere to now you know whatever bitcoin does those i am a scientist so if he does something different and my model doesn't work you know, we have to accept it and yes. we have to understand it. And, you know, that is the beauty of science. We always accept uh, the data. It's not about, you know, oh, my model being right. Uh, I was wrong. I'd rather be wrong and being, uh, a, you know, surprised that actually Bitcoin does much better than what my model does. Now, if it does worse, we are also to understand that too. But I think... It will continue to do this you know yeah. and it will be interesting to see if it doesn't then why what happened what are the events what uh, what is going on with bitcoin why is not following this pattern anymore it is a fact that he did you know like if you I, in fact i want to write a scientific paper and show this and say look you know this is incredible what what is going on why why this happens and it's not just metcalf because some people say well it's because of metcalf metcalf is part of a story but it doesn't allow, it doesn't reproduce exactly this pattern. Uh, there is some kind of uh, um, disconnect between what McCalf uh, predicts and why we have this very precise pattern. Of course, it's part of a story, but it's not a full story. There are other things coming together. But you know, it's still incredible. With few components, we can reproduce very precisely the general pattern of the coin, including these uh, uh, peaks. And it's something that, from a scientific point of view, should be understood and studied. So I want, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a paper about these. But, you know, it's it's fascinating. So, yeah. Absolutely, please. it is. Well, Giovanni, it was very nice meeting you. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing uh, your precious knowledge with me and my audience. And we'll definitely do this again. Um, Thank you. We will figure something out. We'll do it either on Twitter or X or uh, yeah. youtube will, will, yeah it would be great continue. to make one of these spaces it will be really cool absolutely absolutely we'll do it soon well you have a wonderful day down there in san diego and we'll stay in touch okay thank you so much thank you bruno yeah. my pleasure ciao, ciao. bye ciao, ciao.